Yeah, so uh, the first session for today, so basically we've got two sessions. Um, um, next session will be, um, as I mentioned last week, the Patrick Johnston will be speaking, and the first session is mine. So uh, this is uh, basically a brief information about me. So um, I'm a coordinator of front, Frontier Mission Mobilization and Diaspora Ministry of Web International, Um, I'm so pleased to see you all again, and um, so I really appreciate the Anglican Church of Kenya, FICA, to give us this wonderful privilege to share our vision and mission of God. Especially, I would like to give special thanks to Bishop Julius, Julius and Reverend Dr. Joseph and Reverend Titus, who gave us this privilege for the last couple of weeks. And today, I'm going to share diaspora missions. Um, and I entitled my presentation as you see on the screen, Rethinking Mission Movement by Analyzing Missions To, Missions Through, Missions By, and Missions Beyond Diaspora. And today's topic is quite relevant to my ministry practice that what I've been serving for uh, nearly the uh, last 20 years and I really hope that it will help you a lot to know the importance of diaspora missions for the sake of global missions in recent days. Let me just introduce our family first. So, uh, so um, this person just right next to me, a woman, uh, my wife, Mia, and just right next to her, Joshua, my second son, and at the back, um, my first one, Timothy, so we took this photo uh, nearby our parents-in-law's place while we are having our sabbatical last year in Australia. And as you see, um, interestingly, all the people in this photo are migrants who were born outside Australia, except for my children, because they are born in Australia. The other two men in this photo, they are actually from Iraq as refugees, but they have recently become Australian citizens. So uh, we're all from different, different backgrounds, but we are all Australian citizens. Our family came to Korea about seven years ago to serve the nations uh, for the sake of Christ. And as I said, our children were born in Australia and my wife and myself lived in Australia for more than 20 years. So um, my children struggle a lot at the beginning of our life here in Korea because of the language barriers and cultural shocks. And even my wife and myself, we also struggle due to the cultural differences, even though we are born in this country. So if someone asks me about where I'm from, I'm not really sure where I'm from. I've got Australian passport, but I'm not really Australian. I was born in here, but I'm not really Korean. I'm not really sure who I am. Let me tell you about, um, briefly about how my personal identity was changed. I went to the army in 1993, um, quite a long time ago, 30 years ago, and served in the, in the military service for three years full time. Then what happened here in this, in this country, South Korea was seriously hit by the financial crisis in 1997. And a huge number of people lost their jobs and many companies and businesses were bankrupt. So basically, the entire nation was in chaos. And everyone was in despair. We had no hope. We actually were not sure what's going to happen in the future. So everything went really bad during those years. Then I had to make a decision whether I try to survive in this country or just leave my country for my future. And finally, I decided to leave my country and family, and I went to Australia. And I went to uh, university. I really enjoyed my life there, and I was always surrounded by the people. I also really loved my study there. I finished my bachelor's degree, and I was about to complete my master. And then I was accepted for a PhD with full scholarship. 
basically everything seemed really well um uh seems to uh, went uh, go really well but the problem was that i actually didn't know the christ i was born and raised in unbelieving family my grandmother was witch doctor and my parents they practice ancestor worship at least 10 times a year and so on so basically my world view was heavily influenced by the mixture of shamanistic and superstitious belief and the pluralistic ideas of the world. Then I encounter uh, this group of students at the university campus. Um, that was the diaspora mission group uh, for the international students in Australia. So I joined the Bible study meeting and a fellowship with this group on a regular basis. That was actually a marvelous experience for me to, to be with these people, and those who are sincerely taking care of me with a genuine love and kindness. I actually didn't understand even when I had fellowship with these people, why these people were so kind and nice to me, even though they got nothing out of me. And one day, I was cut to the heart as the word of God penetrated my soul and spirit, then I repented and I surrendered everything to Jesus. That's how I became, uh, how I came to know Christ through the diaspora missions group. Then I gave up um, my PhD um, course and went straight to the Bible college for my MDiv course. But the problem was that my parents they're so furious and they're so disappointed by my decision because, because they were non-believers, as I said. So all the support from my parents was cut. And, but I, yeah, I thank the Lord that I, I was able to continue my theological study through my faith in Jesus. But it was so difficult for me to pay the tuition fee, rent, and all the bills without any support during those days. However, the Lord is always good and faithful to me. And I married my wife and I was ordained and I spent 12 years serving diaspora churches in Australia. So um, as I mentioned, I have become a diaspora as I left my country and family I thought that I thought that was done by my will and decision, but I came to realize that was the will of the Lord. The Lord called me out of my home country and family to serve diaspora, just like me. So after 12 years of serving diaspora churches in Australia, I joined WAC International to serve the nations by mobilizing diaspora communities. And even my doctoral dissertation topic at the moment that I'm writing is diaspora missions. Before we jump up um, into the main point, I want to say in conf confidence that diaspora missions is a very strategic and effective ministry to fulfill the Great Commission. Then I want to ask you now, can you recognize the person that you are familiar with in this photo? Maybe some of you. Reverend Titus uh, with red collar shirt. That's how we are able to have this opportunity to be connected even though we are all apart from each other physically, right? And we are able to share the mission of God for the last couple of weeks with you. And I came to know Reverend Titus while he was doing his theological study in South Korea a few years ago. And through the diaspora ministry, particularly serving international students doing theological studies in Australia, in South Korea. That's how we came to know each other. And we became friends. And we have connection and this mission conference is hosted hosted by the special request of reverend titus so we are able to do this 
without connection, uh, we're not able to do this without the connection between Reverend Titus and me throughout the diaspora ministry that I've been serving for the last couple of years in South Korea. The word diaspora is derived from both an Old, Old Testament and New Testament scriptures that the Greek translation of Old Testament calls Septuagint. And in many places in New Testament uh, scriptures, basically the word diaspora means scatter, displays as a C on the screen. Then let's look at the biblical foundation of diaspora missions more in detail right now. According to Acts 17 and 26 to 27, the Lord said, From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in his history the, and boundaries. God did this so that that would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. The Lord is telling through um, this Bible passage that God's concern for all people and his desire for all nations to come to the knowledge of him. God is the creator of all people and all nations. And he desires for all people to seek him and find him. God has a special interest in diaspora communities and he is present with them, even as they are dispersed among the nations. In the context of diaspora missions, diaspora communities have a unique opportunities to share the good news within their communities and in the broader world. And diaspora mission is God's call to his people. God's calling and commissioning of his people to be a blessing to the nations. But throughout the Old Testament and New Testament scriptures, God calls and commissions his people to be witness to his character and his purposes and to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. So biblical concept of diaspora missions is deeply rooted in God's redemptive purpose that extends beyond cultural and national and ethnic boundaries and his people are called the part of that work. And in the Old Testament scriptures, the people of Israel were exiled from their homeland and dispersed among the nations, but they are still called to be witness to God's purposes. There are many examples of God's call to his people in Old Testament scriptures, but I'll cover only several examples of biblical characters right now. The first, um, Abraham. God called him out of his homeland to bless him so that all people on the earth will be blessed through him. As a result, he became known as the father of all who have faith in the Lord. And Joseph, he was sold into slavery and he lived as a foreigner in Egypt, as you know. He, he, he remained in faithful to God and he was elevated to a position of authority in Egypt. Then he was able to save his family and surrounding nations from famine. Daniel, he was taken into captivity by the Babylonians and he lived as a diaspora, diaspora in Babylon. Similar to Joseph, he was also elevated to a position of authority and as he remained, in, remained faithful to God. Then he used his influence to be witness to God's character and purposes. What about Ruth? She was more about a woman who married a Jewish man, but her husband passed away. He just suddenly became a widow. Then she followed her mother-in-law to the foreign land, Bethlehem. 
But she kept her faith in God, and eventually she married Boaz, and she became a great grandmother of King David. Esther was a diaspora in Persian Empire, and she was chosen to be the queen, as you know. And she used the position of influence to save her people from the evil plot. What about in what about in New Testament? Our Lord Jesus was a diaspora as well when he was an infant baby. King Herod, the king, ordered the killing of all male infants in, in Bethlehem in order to kill the newborn, newborn of the king of the Jews. So Mary and Joseph took baby Jesus to Egypt as refugees. We're not sure exactly how many years they were over there, but they lived in Egypt as the diaspora until the death of Herod. Peter, Paul, Philip, and all the disciples of Jesus, they were called to be witness to the gospel among nations. As you know, they all ended up their life in foreign lands to be blessing for all nations. And after the death of Stephen in Acts chapter 8, all the unnamed believers were dispersed throughout Judea and Samaria. The reason why they were scattered was because of persecution, but that was the will of the Lord to spread the good news among nations. <clears throat> These examples, both in the Old Testament scriptures and New Testament scriptures, demonstrate that God calls and disperses people to live in foreign lands as diasporas to accomplish his mission and purpose to bless all nations. And there are also heaps of historical examples that how God called and used diasporas to accomplish the mission and task. But I'll only cover two examples briefly because of the time limit. But firstly, when the Vikings, they invaded and conquered the Western Europe, they took a special delight in burning churches and stealing golds and silvers from the churches and selling the monks into slavery. They also forced Christian girls to be their wives and mistresses. But these uncivilized and barbarians invade, invaders eventually became conquered by the faith of the captives. Usually, it was the diasporas, the monks who were sold as slaves, or Christian girls forced to be their wives and mistresses, who eventually won these savages of, new, of the new earth. By their faith. And John Calvin, the reformer, he was another example um, of diaspora that God called and used him for the sake of his kingdom. As you know, he was born in France and became a leading figure of in the Protestant Reformation, but he fled from France to Geneva, Switzerland, due to the persecution by the Catholic Church and the French government. So all his masterpiece works were accomplished, completed in Geneva as he lived there as diaspora in a foreign land. Then we need to see how the diaspora communities have been perceived and treated by other community groups in the scriptures. So this is the picture that portrayed the images of Jesus and his parents, the crossing borders in our modern times. What do they look like? Don't they look quite similar to the refugees from the areas, conflict areas, and violence taking place, uh, as you know, Syria, Afghanistan, um, quite similar to the people who cross borders that we can see in our media these days, right? So Jesus and his family were refug refugees. They didn't have the shelters, secure jobs, and no one else to take care of them. What about Jews in Egypt in the time of Moses? They were subjected to slavery and oppression by the local people. 
Jewish diasporas were able to have their rights and freedoms, and they were forced to live in separate and limited areas, which is known as ghettos. And they were forced to work long hours in harsh conditions, building cities and monuments for the local people. Of course, they were not welcomed by local people. No one loved these people. But instead, they were discriminated, they were oppressed and persecuted by the local communities. The only, that's only the reason why the local community and Pharaoh wanted this group of people, Jewish diasporas, was because of their hard labor. They can get benefit and profit out of their labor. That is the only reason why these people won. And discrimination against diaspora communities is quite common and a widespread problem in many countries around the world. Diasporas are they're often subjected to prejudice and mistreatment based on their nationality, ethnicity, and religion and other characteristics that make them different from the majority population. And discrimination against diasporas can take many forms, including unequal treatment in the workplace, housing dis discrimination, restrictions on their rights and freedoms, and verbal and physical abuse. Diasporas are also often subjected to negative stereotypes and misconceptions which can further fuel the disc discriminations and prejudice. Like I already mentioned, I spent more than 20 years in Australia. I've seen many cases um, like sometimes road, uh, road rage uh, taking place, right? So, it, like, while I was driving, sometimes I made a mistake, right? Because I'm a human being. But what what the drivers uh, from other car, they do, they look at me and like, <sighs> Chinese, you know? I've seen this many times in in my country. And this is not the only problem in the West, but it is very common and widespread problem in everywhere. So this is also my personal experience when I was in Egypt about 10 years ago. Yeah, while I was walking on the street, um, a group of people chased after me uh, because I look quite different to these people, right? And they're shouting, Sini, Sini. Sini means Chinese in, 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 in Arabic. Sini, go back to your country. Yeah. Then one day I was stoned, a couple of stoned by local people because I have a different look. And this image was on the news coverage at the top headlines the South China Morning Post about three years ago. 30 second version of, of the video clip went viral that two Chinese nationals being brutally uh, abused by the group of Kenyan men. I don't know where it is, but it, it just took place. And they shouted at these Chinese nationals that you are Corona. You are Corona. I think some of you already have seen this. And but heated debates were going on about this issue around the world, even in South Korea, because some of our Korean nationals also, they abuse um, in, in foreign countries, like exactly the same as what, what, they, the, what they're treated. You coroners, go back, because they are Asians. I know that was a, just a small incident. The majority of people in Kenya 
I know they don't agree with, but they're not doing it. They're kind and nice, I know. But this small incident shows our negative perspectives on the people from the country, foreign countries, which is largely being shaped by the false media propaganda. So when you watch um, Hollywood movies or um, films or uh, dramas um, um, like made in like those countries, Western countries, like Asians normally portrayed as ugly, you know? So this um, negative image and stereotypes, um, those stuff are created by false media propaganda. However, our Lord has a totally different perspective on diasporas. As I mentioned already, God calls these people out of their homeland and families and commissions these people to be witness to his character and purposes. And God commissions these people to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And now God is using diaspora as new mission forces, I call it special weapons. Diaspora is the special we weapon for God to complete the task of Great Commission. As they all know that Jesus told us to make disciples of all nations, and many followers of Christ committed their lives for the sake of the Great Commission for the last 2,000 years. But as you see, there are over 40% of people groups around the world still remain unreached now. And we need to reach out to those people groups for the sake of Christ. Here the term unrich means the people groups a group that there is no indigenous community of believing Christians with adequate numbers and resources to evangelize their own people group without outside help. Then some of them might think, I might ask, now, what is the people group? So the people group is demographic unit that which is defined by sheer characteristics such as language, history, ethnicity, religion, customs, and social practices. For example, Kenya is a one country which is defined by geopolitical boundary, but there are 110 people groups share common language, history, ethnicity, religion, customs, and social practices. And sadly, 32 people groups still remain unrich, and that is your obligation and your duty to reach out to those people groups. And now, we're still facing many challenges to overcome and reach out to the people who have never heard of the gospel. And as you see, five out of six remaining 7,000 unrich people groups, they live in the place where the missionaries from outside are difficult to access. For example, there are many unrich people groups in living in small villages located on the mountainside in Vietnam. But the missionaries from outside, foreigners especially, they're not allowed to access those tribal groups. Then the question is, who should go and tell the love and grace of Christ to these people? This, that is even more worse, as you see on the screen, only one out of 10 missionaries work among the unrich people groups. Other 
nine out of ten missionaries work among uh, the people groups that already um, churches exist. And a large number of missionaries have been deported from their mission fields due to many reasons. The persecution of Christians has increased in many parts of the world. The scale of persecution and the number of Christians who have been killed for their faith and has increased in recent years. According to recent figure, every three minutes, one Christian is being killed because of their faith. This is obviously another hurdle to overcome in order to fulfill the Great Commission. And political turmoils taking place in many countries these days, such as Myanmar, as you know, the coup, military coup happened over there. The entire nation was in turmoil. Afghanistan uh, was occupied by Taliban. The old missionaries kicked out of that country. There's no one else to preach the gospel in Afghanistan. The people dying without knowing Christ, knowing Christ in Afghanistan, Ukraine, and so on, which makes it so hard to bring the gospel to the people who do not know the love of Christ and they're dying without knowing the grace of Christ. Of course, the pandemic has become another huge obstacle to fulfilling the uh, task of Great Commission. And next, uh, the speaker for next session, Patrick Johnston, will, will deal with more in details about this issue. The decline of Christianity in the West is also another hindrance and challenge to carry out the task of the Great Commission as well. Many churches in the country where I'm from, Australia, have been sold to become clubs and pubs and coffee shops because there are no people in the church, only some elderly people in the church, and there's no young generation in the church. One day, a friend of mine in Australia, um, he's a pastor of a um, denomination called United Church of Australia. Uh, he has been serving um, one congregation uh, for more than 10 years, one of the suburbs in, in, in Sydney. And his congregation um, was merged with another congregation, uh, which, is, which is located next to the suburb because of decrease in number yeah and these days he told me um, a couple of months ago um, he's worried about his congregation will shut down within five years because there are no people in his congregation he's already been merged two churches together yeah but he's worried that his church will shut down within five years that is the reality in the western countries uh, these days the decline of christianity in the west has brought a huge and negative impact the decline in number of missionaries as you see the screen yeah uh, maybe um some of you might think oh as i see the figure still have a lot of missionaries out there some of you might think but we need to see that a lot of them going to retire within 10 or 20 years period for example sadly our organization what international we are quite big organization we have more than 2,000 full-time missionaries around the world but average age of our missionaries is 52 I, I turn, I will turn 49 this year, but I'm, I'm quite young within our mission community. So which means the majority of our missionary will retire within maximum 20 years or 10 years time. Then who's going to pick up the task 
task to preach the gospel in the mission field. The declining number of missionaries is, is not the only problem in the West, but the second largest missionary sending country, South Korea, is also facing the same problem. Mission Korea, which is the largest mission convention like Urbana in the United States, which takes place every two or three years in this country, many, many young university students that came and participated in this mission conference and they're motivated, they're challenged, and they, they committed their life for the missions. That happened a lot. That's how um, uh, this country has become the second largest missionary sending country in the past. But there's dramatic decrease, as you see on the screen, in the number of participants in the past 10 years Mission Korea in year 2004, we had 6,000 participants, they're all young university students. Then Mission Korea in year 2018, we have only 10,000 participants. And Mission Korea, which took place two years ago, of course, that was because of impact of coronavirus, but we only had 450 participants only. However, we're not supposed to give up in, on continuing our task of Great Commission because the Lord has never given up on his work of salvation for all nations. So far, I've been telling about the negative trend of global missions, uh, but our Lord is faithful all the time. Many times we think that we do the missions of God but it's actually not. God is the one who is doing his mission. He is the host of the mission. And we are the only the instrument, instrument for his mission. And our God has never ceased his mission task to redeem the nations. So it seems that everything goes not well, as I've been telling you so far, but God is on another plan to accomplish his mission of task. That's what he called a paradigm shift in global mission. When people think about missions, they normally say this, as you see the screen, missions has been usually defined in the geographical term. There's a sharp distinction between here and over there which means whatever things happen here in our land without crossing the ocean or geographical borders, which is not considered as missions work. That is the uh, traditional paradigm of mission. So if anyone serves the diaspora communities on their lands, they are not considered as real missionaries. And it brings a negative impact on, on the fundraising from their local churches because they're not the real missionaries. Because they're still here. They have to go somewhere in remote village um, or mountainside to preach the gospel. They have to cross the ocean. They have to cross the border. That is considered as real missionaries. But well, there's a great shift in the world that has never happened in the past centuries that it actually brings a huge influence on global missions as well. There's a global phenomenon taking place around the world in 21st century, which has never happened before. The people on the move from their countries of, of origin to other countries, and there is huge demographic movement that has been happening in recent days. As you see the screen, there was a sharp increase in the number of involuntary displaced people in the last 10 years. 
There are about 82 million people have been dispersed due to war and violence and persecutions and, and natural disasters and etc. That, that's why we call involuntary displaced people. However, as you see on the screen, that is the figure of year 2020s. But as I do some research on this, um, the current figure, the number of people forced to flee world in violence, persecution worldwide, surpassed the number 103 million last year, which is driven by the war in Ukraine and crisis in many parts of the world. And there's a huge number of people leaving their home countries for their education, job, and business, and so on. Reverend Titus is one of the good examples of that. He came to South Korea for his theological studies a few years ago. So Reverend Titus was a voluntary displaced person. According to figure in 2020, about 281 million people living outside their countries of origin. But if we add it up, I mentioned to you already, 2000, um, 2022 figure, we have to add up 103 million on top of the number, which means nearly 400 million people are dis diasporas in foreign land. And, and we see these people not just as migrants, ref refugees, and students, but we see them as potential missionary candidates for the sake of Christ. And I'll point out uh, the major difficulties that diaspora populations um, usually face. It is quite important to know their difficulties in order to reach out to diaspora groups. The first, cultural social isolation. You know, diaspora populations struggle to adjust to new culture. They may feel isolated from their community and tradition. And diaspora population, particularly the first generation, younger generation will be fine, much better. First generation diaspora, they struggle to communicate, integrate into their new communities because of the language barriers. For example, we have many Korean, Korean immigrants in Australia. Especially uh, my mother-in-law. She spent there nearly 30 years, but she doesn't speak in English quite well. Some of you might say, then why don't they learn local language? Why don't they learn English? But it's actually extremely hard for the first generation migrants to learn language because they're too busy. They have to raise up their kids. And sometimes um, some of these people have two or three jobs. They're too busy to learn local language. Diaspora population might struggle to find work and support themselves in their new communities. And that is leading to poverty and economic hardship. And lastly, for psychological emotional distress. Diaspora populations can experience trauma and stress as a result of their displacement, which can result in psychological, emotional distress. I had the same quite similar problem when I, when I came to Australia for the first time. I was so stressed. I, I had really bad mood all the time because I was homesick. I was not able to speak to uh, the people next to me because I, my English was not that good. So it is quite important for your local churches to recognize and address their needs and to provide the support um, to overcome these difficulties together with diaspora communities in Kenya. But the good news is that their hearts are open to the gospel because they are poor in spirit. I'm not really sure whether you know this guy. His name is Patrick Fong. Um, he's one of the good examples. 
He was born in Hong Kong and he came to Australia for his medical training. Then he came to know Christ while he was in Australia because he was poor in spirit as he lived in a foreign country. Then he's now serving as international director of Web International, which is one of the largest uh, largest mission organization in the world. And my case is quite similar to the, his case. I came to know Christ because I was poor in spirit. I have uh, emotional and psychological problem as I lived in a foreign, foreign land, which means it might have taken a little longer if I were in South Korea then, because I had nothing lacking. So I always give thanks to God that he called me out of my home country to foreign country, and he put me in such a difficult situation for his redemptive um, purpose. The people on the move, the phenomenon, actually gave birth to new missions practice diaspora missions. As I mentioned earlier, the traditional missions paradigm, there's a, there's a sharp distinction between here and over there, which is territorial based definition of missions. But in contrast, diaspora missions can be done anywhere around the world, no matter where you are. If there are any displaced people's community, that is our mission field, even in Kenya. But it is quite important to acknowledge that diaspora missions is not the replacement for the, uh, for the task of global missions, but it is uh, complemented to it. And we need to see uh, the diaspora missions uh, through a um, missiological lens. So, um, there are three types of uh, diaspora missions, as you see on the screen. Firstly, missions to diaspora, which is reaching the diaspora groups in forms of evangelism, or providing social services, then disciple them to become worship communities and congregation. This ministry is actively taking place in most Western countries, including Australia and even in South Korea. And I'm, I'm, I'm really sure it'll take place in your country as well. And missions through diaspora means diaspora Christians returning back to their homeland for the sake of missions. In order to do so, we have to equip these diaspora people and train them and send them back again to their homelands for the sake of missions. And diaspora Christians, diaspora is not only called to serve their own people, but they're also called to serve other people groups too. So motivating, mobilizing diasporas for the cross-cultural missions, it is called mission by and beyond diasporas. So we acknowledge the missions from the West to everywhere has finished already. That is the old paradigm, but the new era from everywhere to everywhere has begun. So WAC International has launched the diaspora missions through the international mission mobilization team that I'm currently involved with, particularly focusing, focusing on missions through diaspora and missions by and beyond diaspora ministry in order to mobilize missionaries from the majority world countries. So here the term majority world countries uh, might, sign, might sound quite new to you, but usually the Western countries call Asia, Africa, or South America as third world countries uh, or like global south. But they actually label these according to their perspective, right? And which is, has got quite negative um, meaning um, behind it. So um, these days we call Asia and Africa and Latin America, uh, except for the Western countries, countries we call the majority world countries. So if we mobilize diasporas, 
they are the special instrument for the sake of global missions. They don't have to worry about the visa requirements if they return back to their countries and serve their homelands and communities in their homelands or neighboring countries even, which is quite easy to get uh, the visa over there. You know, like visa requirement is always the issue for missionaries. It's so hard to get visa in order to um, serve in the, in the mission field. And we are able to deploy um, missionaries in areas where similar cultures and language share. You know, <clears throat> normally, do you know how many years it takes uh, to, um, for example, if we send uh, train and send out the Korean missionaries to um, any other foreign countries for the purpose of mission. It usually takes about at least five years. Arabic countries, even worse, is horrible language. It's so hard to learn for Koreans. Ten or even five or ten years to learn languages alone. But these people, they share similar cultures and languages. And through these people, we are able to build networks and work together with the churches in their homelands. And many of them speak. Um, and the most um, majority world countries, I think, is quite similar to you. Yeah. So the people normally speak at least two or three tribal languages, right? But you know what? Korean, we speak only one language. Korean. Yeah, so these people who speak two or three uh, tribal languages, they're gifted, they're better in language learning. And they're able to learn language of the, the mission field quickly as possible. Do you remember this person as you see on the screen? The person right next to me? If you were in the first session of our conference, um, um, he was the speaker for the first session of this conference. He, he spoke about biblical perspectives of, perspectives of mission. Yeah. So he was uh, actually pastor at one of the Baptist um, churches in Manipur in Northeast India before he came to South Korea for his study, just like exactly the same as what um, Reverend Titus actually did. Then he had a regular fellowship with us, a diaspora mission team of Web International, while he was studying here in Korea. Then he finished his Master of Theology degree here, and he was motivated, mobilized by our diaspora mission team while he was here in South Korea. Then he finally decided to join Web International working with us and now he is the mission mobilizer of WAC International in Manipur in Northeast India. You know we are able to have a partnership with many churches and denominations and Bible colleges in Northeast India through this young man. And now he is the key person to mobilize the young missionaries in Northeast India. Do you remember the average age of our um, missionaries in, in, in WEC International? 52. The majority number of missionaries recruited through him is their all MZ generation, young people. They're so precious. As a result, about 80 missionaries were mobilized recruited in this region over the last few years through this young man. I'm not too sure that whether the Anglican Church of Canada, FECA, actively engaged in diaspora missions or not, but I believe that there are huge opportunities out there in your, in your homeland to serve diaspora communities in your country. There may be many Chinese um, doing um, business over there, um, or even um, many Africans from other countries, many Muslims and communities, uh, they came to your countries 
and live there as diaspora, but which means you have huge opportunities to reach out to those people. Do you agree with this? Yes, we agree. Thank you. So one of the best options to engage with, this is my suggestion, yeah? Uh, for um, ACK Thika, the best option to engage with first diaspora communities there in Kenya is to do the missions to diaspora. In order to do missions to diaspora in Kenya, there are few suggestions uh, for the ministry practice there. The firstly, you need to do the research first. You need to get to know these people. You need to do demographic research. You need to know their culture, their language background, and their, their, their social background, their political background. And you need to educate yourself, not only yourself, but your pastors and leaders of your diocese about the di diaspora communities living there. Without this step, you're never going to make this happen in your, in your land. Research is always takes priority. Second, providing a sense of community. You can provide a supportive and inclusive community for diaspora individuals and family to and make them feel connected with your community, which is quite important. In other words, you need to build a relationship, the personal relationship first. You need to be become their friends. And they, uh, they'll open their heart to you. You know, especially Chinese, the most important thong, thing for these people, guanxi. Have you heard of the word guanxi? With every takes, everything takes upon relationship. If you don't have a relationship, if you're not a friend of them, nothing's going to happen. Third, you can offer language classes, but it has to be free. Don't get the money out of it. You can offer free classes in English or your native language there to help these people to improve their language skills. I told you, many, many of first generation, first generation diasporas, they don't speak local languages quite well. Yeah. So offer a language class to um, uh, first generation diasporas or young kids. And fourth, supporting education. You can offer free tutoring, mentoring programs or other educational resources to support the academic success of diaspora children and youth. And organizing cultural events. You can organize cultural events such as the dance, music performance, to celebrate the traditions of diaspora communities, which is quite effective. Or even um, you can ask these people to bring their own food, Chinese food or Indian food, uh, then you can prepare your own food and eat together, which is quite effective uh, ministry to build up relationship with this community. And providing social services. You can provide social services, such as job training, legal assistance, and housing support to meet the needs of diasporas, individuals, and families. And lastly, advocating for policy change. You can, you can advocate for the policy change of your country on behalf of diaspora communities in, in local council level even, working to improve their access to opportunities and resources. But there are always some challenges to overcome for this. It is quite important to recognize that challenges are a normal part of our life, yeah? Whatever we do, we have challenges, yeah? We cannot avoid them. If we approach a situation with a negative attitude, we may feel overwhelmed and less likely to find effective solutions. 
But if you approach a difficult situation with a positive attitude, you are more likely to find creative solutions. So our attitude matters. Our attitude can greatly impact our ability to overcome challenges. Then let's see what kind of negative attitudes that we, we would have in engaging in diaspora communities in Kenya. Maybe some of you might think, oh, hang on. I know what you're saying. I know that's a good thing, Pastor. But we have so many things to do. For our community first. So serving community, our community is the first priority. Yeah. If you have this kind of attitude, the diaspora communities would never gonna be get any opportunities um, hear the gospel and love of God. Please remember, they didn't come to Kenya by their own will and circumstances. But God brought these people out of his plan to your banyard for his redemptive purpose. Then some of you might think, oh, I know what you're saying, but this is not the right time for us to do. Because we have lack of financial capacity. I know many of your churches have financial struggle, but if you sincerely pray and then uh, trust in God, then God will do the rest. As I mentioned already, God is the host of His mission. It is His task. It is His mission. And we are just His instrument. So first, trust in the Lord that He will give us whatever we need to carry out, carry out the task of saving the lost in your, in your country. Then we need to see, can the Anglican Church of Kenya do the missions through diaspora and missions by and beyond diaspora? Again, missions through diaspora means diaspora Christians returning back to their homeland and serving their communities for the sake of missions. The diaspora Christians not only call to serve their own people, but they are also called to serve other people groups too. So motivating, mobilizing diaspora Christians for the cross-cultural missions, which is called missions by and missions beyond diasporas. Can you do it? Anglican Church of Kenya, think are able to do it? My answer, yes, you can. But there are some requirements in order to do Missions through, missions by, missions beyond diasporas. First, collaboration and partnership. You require close collaboration and partnership with diaspora communities and, and other mission organizations and individuals involved in the mission work, both in their homelands as well as the cross-cultural context. Second, Cultural understanding and sensitivity. You need to understand and respect for the cultures, traditions, perspectives of diaspora communities, which is quite essential for the effective missions through and missions by and missions by and beyond diasporas. Third, effective communication. Clear and effective communication is crucial for building trust and establishing shared goal. Please remember, all the prob problems in the mission field are, are caused by, by poor communications between team members and supporting churches. Fourth, resources and support. Mission through. And missions by missions beyond diaspora require access to resources, which, which is including funding, training, technical support to be successful. And long term commitment. Missions through, missions by, missions beyond diaspora require a long term commitment from the churches and diaspora communities and other partners involved in the mission work. An evaluative approach will need a regular assessment 
and reviews and of progress for supporting church and missionary in the field. You also need the willingness to adopt and make changes as needed. By forcing, focusing on these key requirements that I mentioned above, you can ensure that missions, your missions through missions by beyond diasporas will be much effective and sustainable and have a positive impact on the communities just being served. And there's one more thing that you need to avoid for the missions through, the missions by, and missions beyond the diaspora. Sending new missionaries directly to the mission field without receiving team, receiving mission team, which is so dangerous things to avoid. I'll explain why. If you send, if you, if you um, get missionary candidates um, from diaspora communities, yeah, uh, or uh, from your own local community, uh, you, you train them, you and you send out a uh, new missionary to the mission field, no matter where it is. But these people are like a baby, yeah, which means they need someone else to take care of these, these people. You should not send any of your missionaries without, without an existing mission team in the field. This is my suggestion. For our organization, WEC International, we have our mission teams in, in, in 90 countries. We are available to, to receive new missionaries, no matter where they are from. We are ready for this. And when you send a new missionary to the mission field, please consider the existing team members. I will not recommend you to send your missionary to the monocultural or monoethnic mission teams. It is always better to work with multicultural, multi-ethnic teams for the well balance of the ministry. So, um, like, if, one of the examples um, I found um, from uh, many Korean missionaries, um, um, if you work with a Korean dominant mission team, um, they actually do what they've learned from their home country and copy and paste in, into the mission context. And, and they have, they think they're superior to others. Yeah. So, I would suggest that it would be better to work with international teams. So WEC International is truly an international team with workers from 60 different countries to work together in harmony for the sake of gospel. If you send missionaries, you can't send them out without cross-cultural mission training. How, could they, how can they share the good news with the people? with totally different cultural, uh, historical backgrounds and, and um, without having a cross-cultural mission training. For our organization, we have cross-cultural mission training colleges, which is called MTC, which, which stands for Mission Training College. One located in Australia, one in New Zealand, one in Netherlands, one in Brazil, and MTC is now newly established in Kenya. So we'll have um, 10 minutes presentation about our MTC in Kenya next week. And it'd be great if you um, partner and collaborate with mission organizations having a wealth experience and long history because they have made a lot of mistakes in the past. And we learn a lot of uh, priceless lessons from our past mistakes. For our organization, we've been doing it for the last 110 years. All our workers have inherited the great asset, both in spiritual and ministry practice. So I would recommend you to partner with us for the sake of his kingdom. I think probably many of you heard about this one day. The founder of Coca-Cola, he proclaimed his vision to the public as he said, 
a kind of code in the hand every person on the planet. Then what's the result? As you see on the screen, one man's vision has come true. Coca-Cola is now everywhere in the world. In Korea, uh, one of the countries in Southeast Asia, maybe Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or India, China, even monks, um, they, they love Coca-Cola. Then what about us? Our vision should be greater than this or not? We have Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, our Savior. There's nothing impossible in Him because He's the Almighty God. Then why don't we have the vision that what our Lord Jesus has? This is the vision of the Lord Jesus. According to Revelation chapter 7, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude, and no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne of the Lamb. Then why don't they share his vision together, and work together to accomplish the task of Great Commission? Then we'll see one day, What's been written in Revelation 7, as you see now, this scene will come true one day. We'll stand together in front of the throne, watch the Lamb. Amen. Again, whoever coming from foreign countries and live in Kenya, they don't come by their own will or their circumstances. And it is not a coincidence, but the Lord has brought these people to your back now. You don't have to cross the border or ocean, but your backyard is now your mission field. What you need to do now is to pray together first, then reach out to these diaspora communities in faith in Jesus. Then you'll bear many fruits out of your missions to diaspora there, it is now time to make an action. If you see what's been happening around the world today, I, I can tell that the end is near. We're not sure when it'll take, it'll take place, but our Lord is coming soon. Let's finish the task together for, for our Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joe, for that uh, very inspiring uh, lecture. May our vision embody what Christ has for us. Thank you. Thank you.